two weeks in a row, you don't, you don't have to listen to me preach, right? You, uh, uh, my prayer is you guys all enjoy uh, Pastor Michael Peebles last week. Um, good, we got one. That's good. Um, most of you probably enjoyed the first 55 minutes, amen? Uh, no, it was, man, the Holy Spirit was present. It was a, a great week. Um, today, we have our district superintendent, Pastor Phil Rhodes, and his wife, Rhonda, with us. Um, he's going to bring the word this morning, so you're moving from double A to the majors today, so um, no pressure, Phil. Um, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started, though. Uh, we got several needs in our bulletin. Ralph Keniston still re- recovering from, from triple bypass. Um, Richard Sturgeon, Crystal Hotchkiss, um, Jan Johannes has been sick this week. Um, we're a church full of white-haired people. We got a lot of illness, Amen. Amen. Yeah. No, I've been sick this week. I'm 41. I got gray in the beard. Not on. Well, I got it on the head too. But um, also, there is a a marriage um, that needs prayer in, in our community today. I don't want to go into details, but uh, we're praying for a reconciliation of a marriage. Um, also, Ty came to me this morning, and his his grandmother Lori has stage four breast cancer. So. There's an urgent need, but our Lord is capable, so let's go to him in prayer. Father, we bring these needs before you this morning, God. All the illness, all the the things that we just go through in in this broken, fallen world, Lord, we lay at your feet. God, we trust you with these. We do pray for Lori, Lord, and it's in the, the midst of a battle with cancer, God, that your presence might be real in her life, Lord, that you would minister to her like no human can, that she would feel your presence today at this moment, God. Lord, we pray for this marriage. Father, we pray that you intercede, Holy Spirit, that you would work in the lives of both of these people, God, that you would turn their hearts towards you, and in that their marriage might be reconciled, God. Lord, we pray if there is sin that needs to be repented of, Lord, that you, you convict their hearts. Father, and we, we pray today, Lord, as Pastor Phil gets ready to bring your word, Lord, that you might work powerfully. Holy Spirit, we ask you to fall in this place. God, to change us for our good, but ultimately for your glory. Father, we need you now. Our world needs you like never before. God, we need you in a new and a fresh way, Lord. Today, Lord, let let this word fall on good soil, that we might be transformed and sent to work for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the mercy and the grace in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We serve an awesome God, a a, a God that's always working even when we don't see it. Um, Let us trust that. Um, Got a couple guys out deer hunting two or three. Um, God will forgive you. Your pastor probably won't, though. So um, I'm just saying, I don't think I would eat a deer killed during church hours. So um, Jerry, Steve, when you're watching the, 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 the video, this is for you. Um, anyway, before, before Phil brings the word, his wife Rhonda is musically talented. Um, You didn't get a pastor's wife that was musically talented. I'm sorry. Um, She's good at many other things, but singing is not one of them. But Rhonda will be a blessing to us this morning. So she's going to, she's going to sing a special for us. And then Pastor Phil is going to bring the word. All right, I think they're going to put the slides up here um, of our family. So we have, if you've never met us before, we wanted you to know a little bit about us. Uh, we have been married for 39 years, and we're on our way to number 40 before too long. And we have four children who are all grown now. Uh, the top left, let's see, I'll make sure I'm going the right way, is our second daughter, Amber, and her husband, Caleb. 
And then, of course, in the top center is the joy and delight of our lives, all of our grandchildren right there last Easter. And then in the middle bottom is our youngest daughter, Caitlin. And um, she's been married now for a couple years. And the top le- right is our oldest daughter, Danielle. And she's, she has three children, Finley, Sam, and Genevieve. And then the bottom right is our son, Jacob. He's our third child and his wife, Alyssa, and they have Clayton and Wyatt. So uh, and two years ago, almost two years ago, not quite, we, uh, our oldest daughter, you know, she said she was expecting again, which was a big surprise to us. So the end of February, uh, she had Genevieve. And then the first part of March, our youngest daughter says, Mom, uh, I, I, th- I think we're going to move up our wedding date. Now, the wedding date was October. Okay, October of last year. And she said, when is dad's first free Saturday? And I, <laughs> this was on the first week of March. And I said, well, the last Saturday of March. She goes, I'll get back to you. And the next thing I know, we're having a wedding in three weeks. So it was kind of crazy at that point. We just had a baby and I stayed with my daughter. We planned the wedding. And then two days after the wedding, our son and his wife had their little baby boy. So it was a crazy time, and they're almost two years old now. But it's been a joy and a delight to to have the grandchildren. If you're one of those, you know, grandparenting is lots of fun. Uh, But in the midst of all of that, you know, we live in a world that uh, was way different than I grew up in. And for most of you, it's way different than you grew up in. So my prayer daily is for my grandchildren and my children to serve the Lord. Because we live in a world that's trying to tear them apart and get them on the wrong path and deceive them. So if you have grandchildren like me, you're praying a lot, aren't you? And for your children and for the young people in here, don't let the world deceive you. The world is led by the accuser and he wants to deceive us into believing that the word of God is not true. But the word of God is our lifeline in these days. It's mine. And the relationship with Jesus keeps me, keeps me going at time when my heart is heavy over my kids or things going on in churches and different things. But I'm so glad that I live and worship and and follow a savior who can lead us through those hard days. That daily we can make a choice to still believe that the old way is true and that he's good and faithful to us. It was not the path I would have chosen. I could see no hope from where I stood. And even though I knew what God had promised, I couldn't see how he could work it for my good. Yet this path where pain was my companion it took me to an unexpected place and standing in the middle of my darkness and that is where my heart would learn to say I choose Christ when everything I choose faith, I choose to trust, to believe he is good. He'll come through like he said he would every time. Oh, I choose Christ. I don't know the story he's unfolding, but I know in his will he has a plan. So every day my prayer is to surrender, even when it's hard to understand. I choose Christ when everything around me says give up. I choose faith, I choose to trust. 
to believe he is good. He'll come through like he said he would every time I choose Christ. His grace, it is sufficient whatever happens in my life. I've made my decision. that you've done for us, the way that you've opened up doors and pathways in our lives, Abba Father. And now, just like Pastor Holt prayed, open our eyes to see the pathway that you want us to be on. Open our ears to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us today. And our hearts, Father, cause them, cause them to believe the truths that you have for us, to grasp hold of them and never let go. Anoint Phil as he brings the message, Father God. We give this moment to you and this day to you, and we just want to remind you one more time, Father God, we choose you. We choose to obey you, to love you, to follow you, no matter what the world says and does. And we give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. It has been a joy, and we're so glad that you have your pastor here. And we know you have a lot of memories of Grant, and we understand that. But these are new days with Pastor Jason and his family, and we are so glad. And I think Drew got engaged yesterday. Is that right? Woo! She said, if you'll ask me to marry you, I'll give you $500,000. And he said yes. <laughs> look at that look on her face. What you don't know is, sweetheart, you're going to give him far more than $500,000 by the time this deal's over with. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is a give and take in a marriage. It's kind of cool, kind of fun, kind of fun. Well, we're thrilled to be with you guys, and uh, really, honestly, this really is our fifth time, I think, in just uh, two years, right at two years. And uh, so we won't be back again for two and a half years or three years, probably. So this will be the last time you'll have to put up with this nonsense, okay? And you just hang in there with me. And if I preach really bad, you just smile and say, thank God he won't be back for three years. And it'll get better, okay? And then if you heard Michael last week, you know, he probably didn't even, I, I, did, I don't know if he brought open his Bible. He just, he, thinks, he knows it front to back. 
speaks in Greek, speaks in Hebrew, translates. The guy is a walking genius. I don't know if you know how smart the guy is, but he is an atomic engineer in a submarine. Okay, he has, he's certified to do all that stuff. So he, he's not like if you, if you just thought, oh, that, that guy's just from the hills and he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I got news for you. The guy's a walking genius, all right? And there's not many things that Ron and I have not been in conversation with him, and we've watched others. There's not many things that he cannot have a conversation with you about. From digging a post hole to fixing your truck, okay, to accounting. The guy is just crazy. So we're glad you're able to share life with him, and, 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 and that's good. I don't know if you've ever gotten in trouble before or not, but um, my senior year in high school, I had senioritis. And so three of us boys decided that we didn't need to be in class that afternoon. And uh, just two blocks away was a kind of a quick trip place. And so we just moseyed on up there like the studs that we were. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Some of you men, you've ever, you've ever had a little bit of senioritis in your life. Like, you know, I'm really, and your wife is like, oh, brother. Well, we went moseying on up there, and we got our pop and candy bar, and when we came back down, Mr. Perry was waiting for us. Now, Mr. Perry is the superintendent of the school. He said, hey, boys, come on in here. Well, you know, we know we're in trouble. So we go on in, and his line to me was, you know, I'm not going to suspend you. You're going to still play sports, and I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this, but here's the deal. You do that again, and I'm going to call your dad. And that was the end of that. I mean, just he solved the problem in my life really quick. Call my dad, I would be dead. And so I got no problem doing that. And I don't know about you, but you may have made some decisions in your life that weren't exactly the best decisions. I mean, looking back, you kind of go, what in the world was I thinking when I did that or when I said that or when I acted that way? What was I thinking? Well, Paul is writing in 1 Thessalonians, he's writing to a church that's in the midst of, one, from one waterway to the other waterway, they are a market city. And so there is a market road that comes through from one land base to the other, uh, other side. And he's writing to a group of people that, well, when you have that kind of situation, you have a New York City thinking. In other words, you have a conglomerate of people from all over who think on all kinds of ways. You had the Los Angeles thinking, and maybe you know now it's it's you know, it's more prevalent than it, 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 it has ever been in our nation. So I want you to turn with me over to First Thessalonians chapter five, and let's walk through this. I'm gonna I have to hustle, okay? So I'm not trying to um, be labor points, and I'm not trying to um, small them down. But we I've got to push through, okay? Otherwise, you will be here until the Chiefs game starts tonight. And none of you want to be here that long, okay? So he begins in verses 12 and 13, and he says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. So he's saying to us, honoring those who are in authority over you. And, and in these days, uh, for some of us, that's a really hard deal. We have a hard time honoring people who don't agree with us, who are in authority over us. But Scripture is telling us this morning that we've, we have to come under authority and learn to cooperate with them. We have to stop being critical of people around you. Um, I'm not for sure your circles and the people that you are surrounded by, uh, but here's what I've learned is that almost in every circle, there are critical people. And if you're thinking, I don't know of any critical people in my circle. And so what happens, what, hap what I've noticed is that critical people draw critical people. And if you're a critical person, you don't want anybody positive around you. It's like, boy, they're jerks. I want somebody that's going to gripe all day. Come on. Anybody around here going to gripe all day? That's, that's who I want. And you become a critical person, and then all of a sudden, it starts to increase, and your circle and your tribe <laughs> increases. 
when you look back and you really don't have any real friends because when you are a critical person and you draw critical people around you, there are nobody around, there's nobody around you that you can trust. So you become a very lonely person. Everybody with me? <laughs> Is it resonating? <laughs> okay. So he continues on then when he challenges us in 14, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage and dishearten, help the weak, be patient with everyone. So what he's doing here is he's giving us of this list of things that we want to be like. As Paul looks at it, as we're going to be following Christ, he gives us this list of, of do's and don'ts. And he starts, you would say, okay, it's, maybe it's a list of do's and then it's a list of don'ts, or maybe it's don'ts and then it's do's. That's not what Paul does. Paul starts mixing them up. And so it's a full list of things that you do and things that you don't, all right? So his second thing that he tells you is don't approve of people who cause trouble with those who surround them. Now, we live in a society. Um, we were in this great discussion. We had um, some of my basketball guys um, over uh, Friday night, and we got into this great discussion. And this, uh, one of the guys um, that was there, I'm not, we're not for sure. He's conservative, but we're not for sure if he's a Christian. Okay, I don't want to judge him, I just don't know. But in his conversation, he says, we are, we are going to choose to become active in our area because if you choose not to be active in your area, in essence, you are agreeing with what the area is doing, whether you agree with it or not. And I have thought much about that in, 20, in 48 hours. And he has a point that in... In our society, we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And so what we do is we find ourselves being quiet when we should have stood up for what was right. The reason I know that is because I'm living in America in 2022, and the church has remained silent over things we should have been standing on the pillars Beckoing over the county lines. And we have sat quiet and said, well, we don't want to offend anybody, and we don't want to hurt anybody, and we want everybody to come to church, and so we're just going to be quiet. It's time for the church to rise up. It's time for Christians to quit sitting on your thumbs and get in gear. We need you on city councils. We need you in boards. We need you leading committee groups. We need you involved in high school. We need you on the student council. We need you leading your government classes. We need Christians to rise. All right? It's time. We have sat quietly for far too long. And now we find ourselves here. And what do we do? We gripe. Well, we're guilty. We're griping about us. So hush. Quit it. I don't want to hear it. If you had done what you should have done and I didn't, we'd have done, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So it's time for you to get in gear. Okay? Everybody with me? Okay. You didn't know you had to wear your steel toed shoes this morning, did you? If I'd have told you that when I started, you'd have, you'd have shut me off. All right, number three, remind the small soul, timid person. Now, so you're going, where, where, where's he getting that at? This word disheartened, uh, when you break it down in the Greek, it means small soul, timid. Remind the small soul, the disheartened, those who need to be encouraged, remind that person that we serve an incredible God. That it doesn't matter what your circumstances, it doesn't matter what you're going through, that we serve a God who is fully capable of doing immeasurably more than we could ever ask or think. We serve an awesome God. I went through this time frame when, you know, everybody was using the word awesome. Oh, you're awesome. Oh, you're, that's so awesome. You know, that baseball team's awesome. No, they're not. Because when you look at how the root word of the word awesome, it's only attributed supposed to be only attributed to God. The description is that it causes us to be in awe of the one we stand in front of. He is awesome. Well, we're one day we're going to stand in front of God, and I'm telling you what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be saying, you are awesome. <laughs> All right? 
I love the Cardinals, but they're not awesome. And I love my wife. She's not awesome. All right? I serve a God who is awesome. And that's who I want to serve all the days of my life. He says, encourage those who are disheartened. Then he says to us, help the weak. Come alongside the weak and support them. Quit griping about them. Quit saying, you know, you can't do this. Decide you're going to do something. And I love your thing you're going to be doing for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay, now here's, what, here's the danger of what churches do. So I'm not hitting you hard. I'm just loving you gently. All right? We come into Thanksgiving and Christmas and oh, we're all about giving. I mean, we're going to sacrifice all of our used clothes that we don't like. We're going to go to the food pantry and we're going to get the cans of stuff that's been there since Jesus came the first time. And then we're going to give it out. And we're going to say, oh, bless their hearts. You know what bless their hearts means in the south, in the south don't you? Okay. You know, that's when, you, that's when the person sings off tune the whole song. And you walk up to them and say, bless your heart. You know, it's not a compliment, all right? <laughs> Dear God, help them next time. So here's what I want to say to you. You can't be a church that only does this for a moment. This has to become the pattern in the church. We're going to decide. We're going to do this. Every, and you figure it out, I'm going to tell you. We're going to do this every so often. And it's going, to, it's going to become a part of our DNA. We are not going to sit here and be those people that only do it on Thanksgiving and Christmas. We're choosing to make a difference all year long. And it doesn't matter what they wear or how, where they come from. We're going, to, we're going to love them. All right. <clears throat> Number five. Be patient or long-suffering. Don't give up on people. Have you ever been around people that <clears throat> you wanted to give up on? You wanted to just say, I've done enough. It's obvious you can't do, you can't do anything, so I'm done. I've, I have been around those people, and I have said those things. If you can't get yourself up, I'm tired of helping you. Now, if you do that by the instructions of the Lord, that's one thing. Because I think oftentimes people who are struggling, they have, to get, they have to get to a spot in their life where they have to hit the bottom of the barrel. And what happens is, in the church, this is where we're really, <laughs> we're really terrible at this, is about the time that God gets them to the bottom of the barrel where there's nobody else to depend on, then somebody in the church rescues them. Now, we do it on our own. Self-will. Oh, I want, I want somebody to pat me on the back and say, how wonderful you are. Oh, you saved that person. You saved that marriage. You're great. And God is going, oh, brother. I've been working for 30 years to get them to that spot. They were almost there. Let them go. Why? Because so many of us have to get to the bottom of the barrel when we don't have anything else to depend upon until we turn to God. When we get to that bottom of the barrel and we turn to God, I'm telling you, we have found out there is nothing else that works, so I'm all in. Those are the people, I'm telling you, those are the people that come into the church and they're like, man, you better get out of their way, dude. They're all in for Jesus. They're showing up at everything. They're helping everybody. You've got rocks to pick in your yard, I'm there. you got trash to pick up, we're there. Here comes my family, you're thinking, you don't even have the right clothes on for this weather. I'm really. Then here they are. Why? Because they have been to the bottom of the barrel. And they know what brokenness is. And they have found a God who would reach into their barrel and pull them out and set their feet on a solid rock. We sing out of the deep miry clay. He set my feet on the solid rock to stay. Mm. Don't give up on them. Stats are telling us that maybe one day you guys will start one and you'll have a recovery group here. 
they're coming out of pornography, they're coming out of drugs, and they're coming out of alcohol, and the list will go on. I'm just telling you right up front, or just be really honest with you, it's been one of the hardest things you've ever done in your life, okay? Because they'll come in, and, uh, you know, like poor Ron, my wife, you know, we're going to get the recovery group, we got a big group of people that were coming in, and when, when, when they take, when they get out the first session, and they have a break before they go into small groups, if you're doing celebrate recovery, you know what that group does between group one and group two? They go out the back door and smoke up. And they smoke a, a lot. Okay? And my poor wife, she'd walk in the church. She said, I smell smoke. I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And then we, we had a bunch of guys and gals here this weekend. They, they lit it up, man. We finally had to put a, an ashtray thing in the back door so we could control. We didn't burn that building down. Okay? Here's what we have a tendency to do, and here's what churches I'm seeing are doing. They'll do it for a while, and then they'll get sick of it. It takes a recovering addict, and I get this, it takes a recovering addict, on the average, seven stints of rehab. In other words, they try it seven times before it finally works for them. And we in the church... We'll give them twice, but we for sure aren't giving them five. And it's going to take them seven. And we've cut them off and said, we're not putting up with your alcohol. We're not putting up with your smoking. And we're not putting up with that cussing around here. This is the church. Oh, for goodness sake. Why do you think, where do you think Jesus went to? Come on. He went to the down and out. He went to the bars. He went to the red light district. That's where Jesus went. But he also went to the palace. Now that's the key. And that's the key for the church of the Nazarene. See, we don't care whether you're rich or poor. You just need Jesus. We're going to minister rich, poor, we don't care. You are lost without Jesus, and you need him, so therefore you matter in the kingdom of God. Amen? Okay. All right. You guys are doing well. Six. Sixth thing he says here. He says, resist in, in this idea of, in verse 15, make sure ever, nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what's good for each other and for everyone else. So, so basically he's saying resist the desire to get even. Have you ever been wronged in your life? You're liars. <laughs> You're like, no, I'm not raising my hand. We've all been wronged, right? You know what the first thing we want to do when we get wronged is? We're going to get even. Yes, we are. And then the other thing that we do is, we've been taught this by society, maybe inside the church is, well, I'm not going to forgive them because you don't know how bad this is. So I'm just going to hold on to that. And one day, then I'm going to get even. Now listen to me. By not forgiving those who have wronged you, you give them permission to hold the padlock to the chain that padlocks your heart. And they drag you around wherever they go like a whipped dog. You're saying, they don't drag me? Yes, they do. And here's how I know. Have you ever gone to a grocery store and somebody is in the grocery store that you know and you've got a little issue with them? What aisle do you go down when they're coming down aisle six? Well, you don't go down aisle six, I'll tell you that. You're going down five, four, and three, and two, and one, and out of the door. So what's going on? They're controlling you. I, I laugh at this one. In a small town, I don't know here if you guys have this, but in small towns, everybody knows what everybody else drives. You know, and, and I'm learning in, in Carthage, I'm, I'm figuring out some of my friends' cars, and I've, I can see them coming. I've got my neighbor's cars figured out now. And here's what happens when you hold on to the stuff. When you're seeing that person that you don't like coming down the road, 
we get neck problems. You, you know what I'm talking about? We're doing this. Whoa. Look over there. And then we drive right by them. And you're thinking, what's that about? Didn't want to see them. Now watch this. They control you in a grocery store, and they control you in your car, for crying out loud. And until you let it go, all of your life. Here's what's interesting. The very thing we don't want to be controlled, we volunteer for. And until we forgive, we walk around with chains rattling through the doors of our homes and our churches, controlled by someone we can't shake. And then as if that's not heavy enough, then, then Paul goes in, in verse 16, and rejoice always. <laughs> it's like, okay, why don't you just turn that page really quick on us. I got to forgive everybody, and then you want me to rejoice always. In the hospital when I'm watching my spouse die of cancer. When the bills aren't being, can't be paid. When the family's not getting along. When the kids have gone their own way. When the boss is being an idiot at work. Rejoice always. To be grateful and thankful all at the same time. To rejoice always. Listen to this quote. Let me tell you, let me, let me preference it before I say that. Uh, we have been studying Mark 4 and 5 in um, another setting. And uh, so Jesus is in the boat and he's going across the Sea of Galilee and the disciples are all upset because the storm has hit and they start screaming at Jesus. And Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is in the boat. <laughs> but Jesus is sound asleep in the boat, which is amazing to me, which probably represents a couple things. One is, storms really don't bother Jesus all that much. And it really doesn't matter the size of the storm. Because watch, he's still master of the storm. No matter what size your storm is going through, when he decides to stand up and speak those words, peace, be still, I'm telling you, that storm is going to come under authority. In your life. So rejoice always. Then he says to us, pray continually. I've always, when I heard this as a kid, I've always remembered this. Um, and this is, I'm not hammering anybody. This is just how you look at it. Uh, you've seen um, movies with uh, the priest or maybe the nuns, and they're walking around like this through the, through the buildings, and they're doing this. And you've seen, you know, you've seen some, some music stuff, and they're doing this. <laughs> That's how I picture when he said, pray, pray continuously. I'm going, I'm not walking through the high school like that. What do you think I am, crazy? You know, I'm not going to college walking around. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to work. Going, mm-hmm. I'm not doing that. Because that's what I was thinking. But what he was saying to all of us, and you already know this is, is to be in such a relationship that your communion with God is livid and alive and working all at the same time. That you can express yourself in whatever way you want to, and he will hear everything you say. I am amazed at this. Um, one of the things that we're finding out is the lack of people who are having daily devotions. It's, it's at, we're at a spot now where it's starting to really disturb me. If somehow we think that I can have a relationship with God and I don't have to have a conversation with God on a daily basis, okay? If I want a good relationship with Rhonda, and so on our deal, she travels with me every Sunday, okay? We're in the car a lot. I'm not home a lot. When I am, we, we try to do stuff. And so 
Friday night we had people over. And, and yesterday we were down at Camp Table Rock. No whoopee, no celebrate, no whoo. <laughs> Come on, work with me here. Get them arms unfolded. Woo! We're at, camp, okay. we're at Camp Table Rock. And then this morning we leave early and here we are. Okay. And so tomorrow we leave. We'll be at Mid-America Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And that's my life. Okay. She's with me. We have chosen for her not to have a job, but she's going to travel with me. Now, you got blessed because she's with me today, right? Woo! Okay? I mean, it's the better part of the deals when she stands up, you know. It's downhill from there on, when we travel. So what, I'm, what, what we have, are finding is, is that we, we are working hard at talking all the time. But because we're together a lot, guess what happens? So now we have to talk more because we're together more. Everybody with me? If you want to be locked in with Jesus, you got to talk. And when you start talking to him, he's going to go, um, that's not how I talk. What you said at work yesterday, <laughs> I was standing behind you, and um, I don't talk that way. And you're like, oh. and uh, hey, last week when you are at church, <laughs> I was, uh, I was sitting behind you. I read your heart. And I don't have that attitude. Sorry. The more you're with him, the more he's going to go. Now, you can fight that. Or you can say, okay, Rhonda, what's my problem today? <laughs> and you can begin to deal with it and work through it. All right? Verse 8, 18. So give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. And everything, give thanks. <laughs> I love being around positive people. Do you? I mean, they're, they're the people that, you know, it's raining and it's snowing, and you say, how are you doing? And they say, isn't it a gorgeous day? You know, they're the people that have just wrecked their car. How are you doing? Oh, I am so grateful for insurance. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but you're talking with them. Hey, uh, I heard you lost your job. Yeah, but I'm looking at getting a better one. I just love being around those people. I would like to be one of those people. Yeah, I'm so positive people want to be around me. Just for me to rub off on them. Then he jumps into this 19. He says these couple of do nots. You know, don't quench the spirit. So always cooperate with Jesus. Live in the flow of the spirit. Number two, he says don't speak against the prophet. Uh, this word that he uses to describe this is, you know when you have a candle. Whoops. Well, you've had candles up here. Um, when you have a candle and you go to snuff out the candle, but you, and you do that to the candle, that tss, you with me? Okay, tss, that, that, tss, that's what he's using to describe this. Don't tss the preacher. Don't tss the preacher to his face. Tss, don't tss the preacher to his back. Matthew 18, you got a problem with him? Don't you dare go talk to somebody. Because now you're more guilty than in the entire situation. Matthew 18 says you come talk to him. And I know Jason, and you're learning Jason. He's going to listen to you, and then he's going to tell you you're wrong. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. <laughs> and he's going, hey, no. No. He's going to listen to you, and you're going to have a conversation. So we follow that Matthew 18 principle, and we don't do that to the prophet. Okay? But test them all and hold on to what is good. So he gives us three admonitions now. So he's reversed it again on us. Examine carefully. Measure things and people by the word. Quit making rash decisions and quick decisions by not praying and not fasting and not... Spending time with the master. 
if you're going to if you're going to grow in the Lord, you have got to spend daily time with the Lord, okay? Not once a week. The church <laughs> this, I'm sure it's a wonderful place, but I'm telling you this ain't it. Okay? And you can't throw the responsibility of your spiritual growth on him. When you when you come to church on Sundays, you need to come in with your cup full. I mean, you're walking down and you're just bouncing with Jesus. It's just spilling out everywhere. Why is that? Because you've been with the master during the week. And you are your cup is so full. When you come into church, it doesn't matter what he preaches. You got Jesus just spilling out everywhere. Don't throw it on him. It's not his problem. It's not, you're not his responsibility. His task is to help you do that too for others. But when you come in, man, your cup ought to just, I just got Jesus there. I mean, I'm just spilling Jesus all over you. I mean, you stand next to me and it's like, oh, brother, he just drenched me again. I'm sopping wet with Jesus. Why? Because I've been in the presence of Jesus this week. And if you're not spending time with the master, your cup will be empty. And here's the the deal. You'll come in thinking he's supposed to fill your cup. And I'm telling you, I don't care if he's Billy Graham. He will never fill your cup enough. You've got to do it in your home. You've got to do it in your life. Okay? Oh, some exercise. Don't let the good, don't let go of the good, he says. Enjoy the good. Don't let someone steal your good. <laughs> and, that, and, th- and this is the whole, the whole mindset here is the, the stealing of your good is, is, is I'm not going to let go of that, that which I love. So it's, it's the deal when, you, when, when somebody says, I, I'm not letting go of my good day. <laughs> I don't care what you say. I'm not letting go of it. I'm not letting go of my faith. I don't care what you say. I'm not letting go of my journey. I don't care what you say. I'm just, gonna, I'm just holding on to it. Number three is, then he, he reminds us, don't go to dangerous places. Don't watch tempting things. Guard your mind. Be wise in all of this. Be careful with what you do. Um, I've asked every pastor on that district, to put covenant eyes on all their devices. Covenant eyes is a pornography protection system, accountability pr- program. So it's on here. It's on my phone, and it's on the computer in the office. So if I go straying, my secretary is going to get this picture of this, whatever I've been looking at. Okay. And we've asked every pastor to do that. You say, well, why are you doing that for? Because 80% of all men in the last six months quite possibly have looked at pornography. Women are just under that. When you jump that down to those who are 16 and younger, it stays really close to that. Now, here's the scary part. When it gets to the age of 12, it's over 50%. Of all, of all boys, 40% for girls, have looked at pornography in the last six months. So Paul says, you're going to have to watch yourself. You can't go over places that are going to set you up. <laughs> and let's be honest, for the most of us, if you folks want to have a good day Monday morning, <laughs> shut the stinking news off. You'd have a much better day if you didn't watch CNN, Fox, if you didn't read it. Because by the time you get done watching it and reading it, you're agitated, right? I know I'm right on this. So if you want to have a better day, Quit it. Shut it off. So here's what we did. Rhonda and I, we have this, we have a TV in our bathroom. And so when we're getting around because of this way we schedules, the news comes on. 
one of them. And so for years, years, we watched the major headlines, the weather, shut it off. We know what was going on that day, and then we know the weather. Good. In the last few years, we shut that sucker off, and I don't watch it at all. Okay? I try to see the headlines because, you know, it's my job. But I don't want, that's all I want to know. Was there an earthquake in Zambia today? That's, I just need to know that. Okay? And so if you want to fix your attitude, just shut your TV off and your computer, and you'll be just fine. All right? It will be a healing thing for your marriage. All right. Now, so Paul says all of this, and then he says to us, and I think we ask ourselves this question, how in the world can I do all of this? Verse 23, if you've been in the church of the Nazarene any length of time at all, you have heard this preached a thousand different ways. And now may, now may the God of peace sanctify you wholly. May your whole body, soul, and mind preserve, be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> so let me just deal with that really quick. This word sanctify in the Greek comes, it's hagiodzo, it's a, it comes off of the word, the base, the summary of it is uh, agios, which is holy, and then he, he plays it into an active, so he makes it off, he makes it into an active verb, that you would be sanctified, you would be made holy. That verb is taken out of the Old Testament context, and let me explain to you how, what, how, it, how it operated in the Old Testament. So, so every year, you, as a, as a good Jew, you came to the temple with a major sacrifice. Major. The, the, the going into the bank, writing your $100 check, didn't do it for this one. This had to be something highly valuable. And everybody was going to be watching, so everybody knew. So if you were very poor, you would go to, to the temple that day, and uh, you'd get your, out of your house, you didn't have much, but you had your, you had your gold coffee cup. Okay, I'm, a, I'm an only child. Imagination is no problem for me. All right, So gold cup, not a problem. All right, Gold cup. You take it to the priest. You offer it to the priest. As a sacrifice for your family. He goes into the Holy of Holies and he prays for your forgiveness of your sins. And it's an incredible moment. But here's what happens to the cup. He sanctifies the cup in a ceremony. He agiazo, he makes it holy. And what he did was, he makes it separate from everything else that could be used in your life. So you brought the cup he prayed over it, and now the cup can only be used in the temple for the glory of God. He sanctified it. Paul says, you need this sanctifying through and through. Your mind, the way that you think, you need to be sanctified so that your mind only operates for the kingdom. Your soul. Your spirit, your spirit that's what is eternal. Your soul is who you are. Now, here's where we battle that, okay? We battle with this idea of the soul. Mind, emotions, will. Mind, emotions, will. So, I'm sorry, I jumped, I jumped, didn't I? I realized what I did. Body, physical, let me back up. Body, physical, spirit is eternal. Soul, mind, emotions, and will. So, what we do is, we need to have our mind, emotions, and the will sanctified by the Spirit. So that what I think only glorifies the Lord. My emotions. Anybody here grew up in a home where your parents were, might have been a little bit angry every once in a while? <laughs> yeah, is there, that's right. That's, honestly, that's the truth. Because we think when we get married and when we grow out of home, we think that's how we ought to operate. Yeah. And so, hey, you, you know, I think you, you think I was joking a while ago with that, and I was trying to have some fun with it. But I'm telling you, if, if my dad would have found out what I had done, he would have disjointed my head from my shoulder. It would have been ugly what would have happened. Because that, was a pub, that would have been a public thing. It would have been embarrassment for mom and dad. And I'm telling you, my dad would have absolutely exploded. Our emotions need to come under his authority. 
so that we don't bring, we don't do and respond in ways that don't honor Christ. But here's the big one. Our will needs to come under the authority of the work of Jesus. In other words, I no longer, it is all that he wants. I'm all in. Whatever you want, you got it. You want my cars? Here's the key. You want my house? No problem. You want my children? Yes. You want my wife, my husband? Yes. You want my future? Yes. You want my past? I'm so glad to give it away. Every part of our life has to come under the authority, the sanctifying work of the Spirit. The only way you can live out, I'm going I'm to stop. The only way that you can live a holy life is to be agiazoed, to be sanctified through and through. Now, some of you have you've lived here and you've lived in Romans 5 and 6. You were saved at, your, at a young age, and it's been wonderful, and, I, and I'm, I love it. Paul said you were justified by faith. Romans 5 and 6. Romans 7 is, I do what I don't like doing. Oh, God, who will deliver me from this wretched soul? And then he comes to the end of 7, and he goes into chapter 8, and he said, thanks be to God. (laughs) And that's where I'm at. Thanks be to God. There is hope beyond my mad temper. There is hope beyond my way, the way that I think. There is hope for my future. But if I don't surrender everything, if I don't say to him, be Lord of my life, come in and sanctify me. Take my cup and use it only for your glory. Listen to me. Some of you, you've been living in chapter 7 for so many years. I mean, you want to do good. Some of you young dads, you want to do good, but you say things and you do things and people go, what in the world's wrong with him? Some of you are new to the church. You, you, it, it's not that you're a bad person, but you've made decisions and you've looked back and said, what in the world? What was I thinking? I'll tell you what you were thinking. Your thinking was controlled by yourself. It was no longer controlled by the work of the Spirit. Some of you this morning, You don't have to leave here living in Romans 7. You could walk out of here in Romans 8. And the chains that have drugged you for years can be snapped in a moment. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Father, right now, your Holy Spirit, is he stepped into this room a while ago. And you're so close to some of us that right now give us the strength it's going to take to do what we're going to do here in a moment because we can't do it on our own. We invite you. We invite you right now. Come and help us. Deliver us. Help us to make the decision we're going to make. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. I'd like for you to to join me in standing very quietly, very reverently. Where you're at, just join me in standing just quietly. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. You don't have to worry about anybody else's business. Some of you, the Holy Spirit has knocked on your heart this morning and you've said, you know what? I can do something for, for what Pastor Phil's talking about. If you'll let me have your life, if you'll let me work in your journey, I can do something for you that nobody else could do. You don't have to continue to put up with this. You don't have to be the person that you are. You can be changed in a moment. In a moment, the Holy Spirit can do what you've been trying to do for years. If that's the case, I want to open the altars for you. Would you just come and kneel and just spend some time with the Master? He's waiting on you. He's calling you this morning. He's, the Old Testament, old timers used to say he's woeing you this morning. Would you come on? He's waiting for you. Would you come real quick? Just come. 
You need to come with a friend, come with a friend. You need to come with a spouse, come with a spouse. You need to come with somebody that you don't even know. Just come. He's waiting for you. He's wanting to do something in your life you never dreamed could happen. And this morning, you could walk out of here free and empowered by the work of the Spirit. I don't give long altar calls anymore. I used to drag the things out, but I don't do that anymore. Good or bad, I don't know. But the Holy Spirit speaking to some of you, you've been under the work of the Spirit this morning. You just need to come. I, I, I want to give you that chance, that opportunity. You're saying, well, I, I'll look so bad in front of the church. Look, friend, you already look bad. When you blow your temper, everybody knows it. When you gossip, everybody hears it. When you walk around with the things on your life, everybody goes, man, I wish they'd get rid of those chains. You're not fooling anybody this morning. If the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, why would you leave this room when you could be healed and free this morning by the work of the Spirit? So if he's talking to you, you come right now. Very, very quickly, last chance, I promise. This is it. This is it, and then we're going to pray. Don't want you to miss it. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for those who are new. Ron and I heard something this morning, and it, uh, it, it rattled me pretty good, and so I'm going to do something this morning I want to do. Uh, scripture says where two or three gather in agreement, that God says, I will do it, what they ask. So I'm going to ask you to gather this morning around the altars in agreement that what the Holy Spirit is doing, it will be done according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Now, you don't have to butt into their conversation. If they want to share with you, that's wonderful. But let's come in agreement with these who are needing. So I'm going to ask the church, come, let's go. Let's kneel around these folks. Let's surround them. Let's pray. That until hell bends down and heaven is glorified, all right? Let's pray until we sense the move of God is so deep and rich and freeing. We will celebrate what God is doing. So let's spend some time with the master today, all right? Good, 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 good. If you like, you may be seated there in the pews. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, right now we come into agreement with the work of the Spirit that you want to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we could ask or think. You want to set free captives. You want to break chains. You want to come under and in and take over everything in our lives. And right now we yield to you our mind, emotions, and our will. And God, we say to you, we're yours right now. We're tired of the battle. We're tired of this feeling. We're tired of fighting. We just want to say, come on in and take my cup. Take my cup and use it for your glory. I'm tired of living in Romans 7. I want to move to Romans 8. Right now, God, do what only you could do. Touch and deliver and give hope and deliverance for these who are kneeling right now. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work so thoroughly into their hearts and lives that the work of, their, of your spirit will be deep and settled in their spirits, Father, today. Go to the deep recesses of their lives. Meet every need they have. Hear every request they say. Hear the things they don't even, they don't even know how to pray today. We're, we're thankful, Father, for Romans 8, that you tell us that, you can, that our, your spirit utters to the throne things we can't even think of today. So God, right now, we, we ask for healing. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for hope. Break every chain. Oh, God, break every chain. Give deliverance and hope in the name of Jesus. Do what only you could do today. Father, we thank you that you're faithful. Go to the deep recesses of our hearts. Help us to live in Romans 8 for your glory. We want to settle the dispute this morning. And say we just surrender. 
We surrender to the people. We surrender to the situations. We surrender to the past. Those things that have happened to us in the past, we surrender. We let it go. We ask for your healing. God, would you do, would you do this morning what only you could do in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ? We pray these things. Amen. And amen. Let me share with you one story. I feel like God would have us. Rhonda's up here, and she, she really is. We have a lot of fun. She's a beautiful person inside and out to me. But in her young life, she was molested as a young lady. And uh, it just about wrecked her, and it for sure wrecked our marriage. But God didn't give up on her, and he didn't give up on me. Because when that happens, it affects both. You, I, I hope you understand. It affects your sex life, your intimacy. It'll ruin it. It'll destroy it. And she fought through, and God, in one night, began to bring healing into her life, began to restore and refresh and renew. And I'm just saying to all of you who are here, I, I tell that story to say this to you. I don't know what you've gone through, and I don't know your story, but I know this. The God that we serve can heal you of anything that Satan has tried to destroy you with. You do not have to live in chains. And my wife is a living testimony that you can live in freedom. And she is growing right now at a rate you can't imagine. We're starting to have theological discussions in the car. And I love her. I'm blessed because of her. Let's thank Phil and, and Rhonda just for being here and leading our district so well. So it's just, it's... Forget a pastor's wife who can sing. You need a pastor who can sing, right? Phil is... Uh... Great. Let, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll dismiss. Father, thank you, Lord, for what you've done today. Lord, what you've been doing this week leading up to this moment, Father. We thank you that you are in the business of changing lives, sanctifying us. And as we go about our, our week, Lord, would we just be a, a vessel for your Holy Spirit, Lord? And be a, a, a blessing to those that are weak amongst us, Lord, that we might be that positive person that just our cup is full and we, we just spill Jesus everywhere we go. We thank you for the lives that were changed today, for your glory, God. You, you tell us, Jesus, that, that the harvest is right, but the workers are few, Lord. And, and I believe through this small group of people that you are doing something here in this building but in this community. Would you keep us close to you, Lord? Would you give us the, the discipline, that, that nudging that we need to have those daily devotions that Phil talked about, God? Would you bring us to our knees to spend time with the Master, Lord, whatever that takes? Keep us close to you and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. One last reminder, so we will be packing boxes at 5.30 tonight here at the church. Um, I would say if you, are, if you want to do it, I'm asking if you are willing to do it, would you be here at 5.30? Uh, and my phone number is on the back of your bulletin. Shoot me a text. Um, just let me know you're going to be here. I'm going to order pizza for everyone. We'll have a great time. We'll play some games. It'll be a good night. Uh, other than that, you are dismissed. Have a great week.